Hey, PD2 Finger here talking about Gibson. I was watching Brad the Catologist. He's, what, isn't that the best channel, guitar channel on YouTube? There's a, I watch a lot of YouTube, watch a lot of guitar content. Uh, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Philip McKnight, Scott Grove, Pete Thorne, uh, those pedal guys, uh, Chappers and the Captain, and then you have, like, the lower, like, you know, like Circle of Tone, uh, dare I say it, Will Easy Guitar seems to, uh, he, maybe he knows what he's doing, um, Has certainly has a following. So I'll leave that at that. Now, checking out the Guitologist, I really uh, enjoy watching his content. It's, uh, from the heart, it seems like you could trust what he's saying. You know, like he's a Midwestern type of guy. Maybe not, maybe he's a little hillbilly in him because he where he's from. But I don't know if he's from Kentucky or where he's from. But he, he's the type of guy that you, you would trust him. You'd think it would be easy to do a, a deal with this guy. Uh, or bargain with him, and when you're watching his YouTube, you tend to take what he's saying from the heart, because that's how he speaks. He's not full of shit, he's not hung up on himself. I've, I've met a good percentage of my life uh, people that are musicians, and a lot of times what I find, especially with um, guitar players who are good, if they're good guitar players, those guys usually, I, they've got this certain kind of attitude about them, Especially the way they, they, they relate to gear, as opposed to less skilled players. Like, I'd be, I'd be much more comfortable talking to a guy who kind of sucks about gear because they're going to know. <laughs> they're going to be able to tell you what's really good and what's garbage. Where the guy who is the pro, the, uh, the ringer, the guy who... Everybody in the town wants him to play lead in their cover band. That guy, more than likely, doesn't know shit about pedals. So, that's kind of how I my, what my experience has brought me to believe. Uh, I could be wrong. There's probably some great players that are into pedals out there. I know for a fact there are. And boy, that's really changed. It really has. And a lot of that has to do with just the internet and guitar channels. Stuff like the Japanese companies making cheap pedals, Moore making the $35 rat or $18 rat pedal, whatever it is you find now. Um, so that's all really exciting and fantastic as a guitar player to see how the market bloom and blossom. And some things, some things stay the same. We have Gibson uh, just messing up, messing up big time. Uh, and that's one of the things that I enjoy uh, about Brad the Guitologist. So if, you, if you're a musician, guitar player, that type of person, and you haven't for some reason checked out his channel, uh, I think it's really the cream of the crop. I, I, you know, like, I really love watching Scott Grove. I do. The guy is hilarious. He is like the John Belushi of the guitar player. He's just naturally funny to me. And uh, his thing is like it's completely different than my approach. But I still, I, I can watch him. I can watch him and I can enjoy it. And like his choices, the stuff that he has, like that mirrored guitar with the flames on it that looks like it weighs 85 pounds. If you know what I'm talking about. But I, I'm making this video to talk a little bit about Gibson. Um, I started out playing... Um, I played an acoustic. I lost my fingertips. And then I uh, bought a electric guitar off of this kid, Jason Mills. His dad had garbage picked it. And it was a... Um, it had a fake Bigsby on it. It was a hollow body with a floppy neck. And he sold that to me for $10. Because that's all. He told me, he said, yeah, I got one, but it's really, it's not good. 
And that's why he got rid of it, is because he couldn't even keep it in tune. And I don't think he was a... a I, he's not a guitar player. I, I, think, I don't think he would be upset with me saying that. I knew him later on in life, and he never played. So I, I had that for a short time, and then a guy uh, dropped off a box full of electro harmonics pedals. He had found Jesus, and he didn't want to have anything to do with the demons of rock and roll. So he dropped off this box with a big muff, a big honking Morley wild leather straps with frills on them. All this like Jimi Hendrix era, like Screaming Tree, Trouble Booster, all these super noisy pedals. Power supplies, cable, like cables. I still have one of the cables. Thank you very much, Peter, by the way, for that. He's not watching. So, uh, went from there to paying 15 or 25 I think maybe I paid 25 for the uh, Memphis, uh, was it a Lotus? Anyway, I had a Japanese Les Paul copy. And that made, made me to dream about um, getting a, a real Gibson. And my dad had a, I think it was a 335. It, it was a Beatle guitar, so it might have been a casino. I, he had that in the storage, and my brother used to open the case, and we would look at it and smell it. And then, of course, my dad got sick, and my older brother, uh, the guitar disappeared. Uh, went up his nose is where it went. So having that, like, loss, and then that connection to that first guitar that I love so much, I really wanted a Gibson. And seeing Jimmy Page, watching him in uh, Song Remains the Same, adjusting his four-volume and tone knobs lovingly in between each riff and just drooling and looking at these beautiful sunburst guitars that was of course what I really wanted and then uh, in like 89 uh, by 89 like 88 uh, like like July of 88 I uh, discovered Adrian Ballou and really changed the way uh, I was listening to music. I was listening to Pink Floyd. It's all I listened to. And all the solo stuff. All the old Sid Beard. Everything I was into Pink Floyd, that was all I cared about. And then I started listening to Adrian Blue, and I stopped listening to Pink Floyd. And by like 91, um, I was really playing a lot of bass. I had... The guitar was at my mom's uh, place, and I was like... I wasn't really around. I was like, I lived in a, she kicked me out. I was living in my car. So I was all over the place. It was like these missing years of my life. So uh, that period, I, uh, if anything, I had this unicorn fretless bass, and that was uh, headless bass, and that was my only instrument. So then, uh, yeah, by the time 92 came around, I had really realized that all of my favorite guitar players didn't play Gibsons. They played Strats. So that's what I bought. I bought an American Standard Strat when they were um, giving them away. If you knew how much I paid for my American Standard Strat, you'd be very angry at me. The story was that they told me at DJ's Music, it was uh, it had been bought for Christmas uh, for a boy who wanted a shredder guitar and came, brought it back. And so I got a real good deal on it. And uh, later on, you know, I uh, through life I, I met people that uh, have this uh, like fetish with Gibson. Like they, there are people like how Harley Davidson is a brand, comp a lifestyle company. That's what Gibson has turned into. And you have to run into a Gibson person before you know what I'm talking about. Now that quote, I got that directly from Brad, the guitologist, uh, 
his last video, that was the top comment. So I didn't think of that, but uh, when I read it, I thought, you know what, that guy's right. It's This is make-believe. This is la-la land. This is the emperor's new clothes. It's t-shirts. It's you worship at the altar of Gibson. They can't do anything wrong. You can't see any of the, uh, that it's a dumpster fire, and you're you know cutting yourself and lighting yourself on fire at the end of the road. That's that's where it leads to. And uh, I'm just not part of any type of that weird fanaticism. I try to. I get fanatic about, about musicians, about artists that can make me weep with their their skill, their talent. When I see them perform, I'm humbled to the point I'm brought to tears. That's what gets me off. Not something that's tangible that you can put your hands on, you know. But uh, that's not to say that I don't like quality. And to wrap the story up, I want to tell you, uh, if, you're, if you're on the fence or you know, let's say you're uh, like me and you don't really feel that Gibson has been anything special for a long time. Now, don't get me wrong. The, the Gibson guitars from the times of yesteryear, those guitars are incredible instruments. And my point is, as of lately, I haven't been able to find a Gibson guitar that impressed me. Every time I've actually went out and tried the Gibson guitars, except for the ones that are uh, 3500 that you can't you can't touch all of the lower price stuff or the Epiphone stuff but it seemed to me that the Epiphone stuff was a lot better quality than the Gibson but uh, the stuff that had the Gibson name on it was so unbelievably bad when we went out uh, so I would encourage you to do this go to your guitar center, your Sam Ash, whatever your local music store is Simply with one idea in mind, and that's to play as many Gibson guitars as you can. You need to ask them if it's okay if you can play the expensive ones. Because um, I looked at them, and what I saw was the uh, the ESP guitar that was 300 was so much better looking in quality from just looking at it than the $3,500 Gibson that... I just didn't, I could not believe it. Like, I, I had, my daughter was coming up, this is going back a few years, she was really, really, really going through this Led Zeppelin thing. And I knew, I asked her about it, about wanting a Gibson Les Paul, because she plays guitar, and she had some uh, Fender-style guitars. She had a, a mini Strat that I fixed up for her with 12s, 12 gauge strings, a ni real nice looking red mini Strat that sounded fantastic. Then she got a Cyclone that I modded out for her that was a sunburst that was beautiful. And uh, then she got a Japanese court Strat that was just a player, just a, an excellent older guitar that I refinished as a George Harrison Rocky. So she had pretty much all Fender guitars, and I asked her, I knew, like, she's got to be thinking, when is the Gibson coming? You know, and I, I asked her about it, and of course she said, yeah, uh, she wanted one. So I tried explaining to her, look, unless you're going to spend five grand or more, you're not going to be able to get a, a, a player, Gibson. You can get a player court for 30 But the Gibson, if you're going to pay 800 even, you know, for a mid-grade, whatever they're throwing down there, or the cheap, the cheap ones are... Uh, like, we looked at them, we went, I took her to the guitar store, I said, because she didn't kind of believe me. I'm like, we're going to go, and we're going to see. And we checked everything out, and I would really would encourage you to do this, to see how bad the quality control and the garbage that Gibson is selling with this, threatening everyone to play authentic, like threatening lawsuits, and the, this guy, you should watch the Brad the Guitologist video, the guy who's the uh, advertising executive for Gibson is, is a 1% one percenter wannabe is what he is. And so they are marketing this to doctors and lawyers. That just, just means that the prices are going up. And that they don't care about anybody who isn't able to throw down 5K at a, at a crack for a guitar. So 
that what that means is I can just do this to Gibson because I'm never I I'm certainly I'm not going to go on some kind of lifelong quest to find the uh, Epiphone that I can sand the decal off and rebrand at Gibson like you know like just that kind of stuff that I think the Gibson guys do because I've known some of these Gibson guys. And uh, I know how they talk about the stuff. I eventually got her an Epiphone. I got her a, a $30 uh, SG that someone had put green poster paint all over it. And I stripped that down and refinished it black and tried to kind of make it look like the Tony Iommi uh, signature SG. So I gave her that guitar, and she's got that... Uh, at her place, that's the guitar. She left some guitars here. That's the one that she took with her, is that SG, and she loves it. She loves that guitar. So, and you know what? It's a player. It's a good guitar. So they they are there are good Gibsons out there. Uh, the Epiphones, I, w I would recommend. Gibson as a brand, we need to seriously look at what they're what's going on. This elitist thing out there. They're, it's the emperor's new clothes. They're saying that their brand is this heavenly thing that you can't really rock unless you have their guitar. But even at thirty-five hundred dollars, you're going to need to spend five hundred dollars on a setup and repairing whatever they didn't do with the factory. And that's just to me, that's evil. So we're, I think, we're going to see uh, much more shenanigans and tomfoolery out of this company. Uh, it's going to take some real serious stuff to happen before uh, it gets turned around. And look for look for Gibson and Marshall to get balled into the same thing. How they have these little iPod amps that look like Marshall's now that are like 600 bucks. That are, they're, they're clock radios. That's a 3 inch speaker in there and you're, you're paying how much are you paying for that? Because it's Bluetooth? Anyway you know, I get my Bluetooth stuff from uh, Goodwill, and it's three bucks. So, all right, you guys, that's something to think about. Um, and I probably will have the comments off on this, but uh, I'm taking a day off. I'm supposed to be recording this album. <laughs> Who cares about that? Anyway, if you f f stuck with me the whole way. The Mr. Bungle show was uploaded, so check that out. It's awesome. Uh, that's what I'm going to be doing for the rest of the night. And good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Although this was kind of a hit piece, wasn't it? Do I deserve to say that on a, a video as negative as this? Probably not. All right, I'll burn in hell later, and peace. <laughs>